Um, decided not to do an objective test simply because it would be really hard. <laughs> There's only two plays, and it would I would just have to be picking out nitpicky details, and you really believe me, you wouldn't want that. Um, so let me go over this briefly. Then we'll uh, finish. Thank you. Henry IV, part two, and hopefully there will be time to get into the first, I don't know, a little bit of Hamlet. Might just be the introduction. Because um, there are problems, I think, with the introduction. Um, so, as with the first one, choose one topic. You've got five here. Um, 750 to 1,000 words or thereabouts, you know. If it's a little bit more, that's fine. Probably don't want to go too much less. Um, two direct substantive quotes from each of the plays. You got some instructions, do at the beginning of class. I don't know why of is capitalized. Um, Thursday the 28th, which is a week from this Thursday, okay? Paragraph about, you know, formatting stuff. Topics, and I'm gonna make a comment about all of these topics to begin with. The topics are fluid, okay? You don't, for example, the first one. In what ways are these plays about the tension between the public and private personae of King's Princess? You can interpret that a bit. You don't have to have as your thesis statement. Henry IV parts one and two are about the public personae of King's Princess in that, okay? Um, you don't have to talk about Henry the Fourth and how. You could choose one, okay? And look at that public-private distinction between the two. Everything after the first question for each topic is just designed to fire your brain cylinders, to get you kind of going, thinking about the topic in one way or another. So. How do their actions in private influence their public appeal? How are their public actions mere public relations? Or, question I didn't even think of throwing it, I don't think it's there. How do their actions in private, well, I'll take that back, it is in the first one. Um, that first question, that, sorry, second question, how do their actions in private influence their public appeal? Notice that could be negative or positive in terms of the influence on the public. Use it as an example. How's actions in private? What does in private mean? Does that mean in, in his room in the castle? No. He's acting privately when he's with Falstaff in a pub. That's not an official public action. Okay, so how does that affect? Okay, those kinds of things. Um, do you see any tension between what the king slash prince thinks and believes and how they publicly behave? Notice publicly, that kind of means officially, all right? But it, it can also mean, you know, just how they are in public. So, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of little distinctions. There's a lot of nuance that you can play with with that question. Secondly, how may these plays be read or interpreted as manuals for monarchs, <laughs> which was a popular genre in the late Middle Ages, 1400 or so, up through uh, at least 1650, 1700. Right? I mean, what's the greatest quote unquote manual for monarch written? The Prince, the Prince by Machiavelli, all right? So that is within the plays, much advice is given about how monarch or future monarchs should act or should not act. So 
by those places discuss them, I, what kind of advice is given. Notice, I don't give a lot of direction on what kind of advice is given. What would make a good monarch? I mean, Henry IV has a lot to say about that. All right? Hal does too in his own way. It's why it's a real shame we're not reading <coughs> Henry V, okay? Compare and contrast the characters of Henry IV and Prince Hal, and then by the time we get to the end of Henry IV Part II, King Henry V. We don't see him act much as King Henry V, but boy, what he does, it's a bit of a doozy. So compare and contrast them across the two plays. Discuss the, number four, discuss the development of the character of Prince Hal, King Henry V, from when we first see him in Henry IV Part I to when we last see him in Henry IV Part II. I mean, he does undergo a change, or does he? Is he still pretty much the same character? I'm not suggesting he is, I'm asking the question, okay? You figure that out, or tell me what you think. How does Shakespeare portray his growth? Is it linear, does it develop in fits and starts with detours along the way? How does Falstaff fit in? How does the rivalry, if that's what it is, with Fox Hotspur fit in? Is Hal the captain of his destiny, kind of always knowing what his objective is and how he's going to achieve it? Or does he merely react to situations that present themselves, okay? Number five, looking at both plays, discuss how both Henry IV and Hal manipulate others and for what purpose, all right? Or what purpose is. Are their intentions noble, honorable, or are they self-serving? Notice what Conjunction, I don't include in that second question. One of my favorite blog writers says, you know, embrace the power of and. The question again, are their intentions noble, honorable, and or are they self-serving? That is, can they be honorable and self-serving? Can serving your self-interest also be honorable or noble? Probably if you think your self-interest is in the interest of the state, country, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we're in the middle of a, of a presidential election. Everything Joe Biden and Donald Trump do is self-serving, right? Because they either want to be re well, they both want to be reelected. put it that way. Does that mean that they're therefore evil, negative, bad, okay? What, how does that apply here? So, you've got, a, you've got five different options. Within each of those options, you can go about it a variety of ways, all right? If you have additional questions, um, send me an email, okay? Like I said, uh, do a week from Thursday morning, beginning of class. It's on... If you lose this, it's on the announcements page, and I emailed it to you. Okay. Four, three, uh, da, da, da. hold on just one second. No, we're not picking up with 4-3 yet. We are going to back up just to here, because we didn't quite get to 4-3. Act 4, scene 2, um... Line, I don't know what it is, about 66, I think. Prince John has told the rebels, we hear your grievances, we hear your issues, and he says, and I accept them. Okay? The Archbishop replies, Archbishop of York replies, I take your princely word for these redresses. What does he mean by that? Okay. You will honor your word. That's what he means. I take your princely word. If a prince acts in an official manner, should that prince lie to the people? Mm, obviously not. Prince John, I give it you <clears throat> that is my princely word and will maintain my word. I will stick by what I said, okay? 
And so he drinks to his grace. They drink, they embrace. Hastings says, go captain, deliver to the army this news of peace, let them have pay and part. I know it will, how well it will please them. So he sends the captain to do what? Two things. Tell them to disband and promise them pay. All right? Westmoreland. I pledge your grace, and if you knew what pains I bestowed to breed this present peace, you would drink freely. So he also drinks to the archbishop, but my love to ye shall show itself more openly hereafter. That is, we will be, it's almost like he's saying, we'll be drinking buddies after this. We'll be a lot closer hereafter. The Archbishop, I don't doubt you. Okay? Westmoreland, I'm glad of it. Notice, this is all very nice. It, it looks almost like what? A fairy tale. A fairy tale? How about a summit between, it's kind of hard now with the fall of Soviet Russia. Summit between the President of the United States and the leader of the Soviet Union. It was all, you know, we drink to each other and we trust each other now. And, and you know, when they go back to their respective parties, uh, it's backstabbing. Okay? So there's talk then among Westmoreland, Mowbray, and the others. And the Archbishop, line 85, believe me, I am passing light in spirit. In other words, He's surprised. He can't express how happy he is at the turn of events. Okay? Prince John. The word of peace is rendered. Hark how they shout. We hear off stage the troops. Yes! We can go home. No more bloodshed. No more civil war. This had been cheerful after victory, Mowbray says. What does he mean? Oh, if only we won. Archbishop, the peace is of the nature of a conquest. For then both parties nobly are subdued, and neither party loser. He says, a peace is like a conquest. The only difference is neither party wins and neither party lose. They both get something, okay? Prince then gives an order to Westmoreland. Go, my lord, and let our army be discharged too. Okay, Westmoreland goes. And good my lords, who please you, let our trains march by us that we may peruse the men. We should have coped with all. That is, let's stand here and let's let our armies march in front of us so that we can see who we would have been battling against. Okay. Archbishop tells Hastings, go do it, the prince commanded. Prince John. I trust, Lord, we shall lie tonight together. Westmoreland comes in. Why stands our army still? He doesn't mean, why is the army standing still? He means, why is the army still, like, shaped in a block? Why is it still marshaled for battle? Westmoreland. The leaders having charge from you to stand will not go off until they hear you speak. You're the general, because he's the prince. You're the one in command. They aren't breaking ranks until you give the order. Prince John, they know their duties. That little short line is just as Hamlet would put, or as Polonius would put it, pregnant with me as we find out very quickly. Hastings comes in. 
Our army is dispersed already. Like youthful steers unyoked, they took, take their courses east, west, north, south, or like a school broke up. In other words, it's the end of term. They scattered, man. When they received the word, there's no battle, go to your homes, they did. So notice what that means is the rebels' army cannot march in formation past the generals of both sides because they've already left. Okay. Each hurries toward his home in sporting place. So York's, Mowbray's, Hastings' troops, they're scattering. Prince John's troops are standing at attention. Westmoreland. Good tidings, my Lord Hastings, for the which I do arrest the traitor of high treason. And you, Lord Archbishop, and you, Lord Mowbray, of capital treason, I attach you both. Mowbray, is this proceeding just and honorable? By pro proceeding, he doesn't mean just what is happening. Proceeding is like a legal term. He's like, wait, is this legal? Is this right? Westmoreland, is your assembly so? What assembly? Leave current politics out. Leave past politics out. Let's say this year a group marches on Washington, but doesn't march on Washington just to have a protest marches on Washington and they have armored personnel carriers and they have M50 machine guns and they have Barrett sniper rifles and it's clearly not to peaceably assemble and redress the government for grievances. Okay, What would the government call that? Would it call it a peaceful assembly? which is guaranteed by the Constitution. No, it wouldn't. The assembly okay, that Westmoreland is asking about is what? You're, you led an army of armed men in what? I'm going to use a term I probably shouldn't because of the, how it's been used recently. Insurrection. This, was, this is real insurrection. What did they want to do? They wanted to overthrow Henry IV. Who, who is going to replace Henry IV, by the way? Is it ever suggested in, the, in this play? Was it going to be Hal? No. Uh, Percy? Mortimer? Mortimer doesn't even figure in this play. Mowbray? It's unclear. Okay. Archbishop, will you thus break your faith? Who's the archbishop speaking to? The one who responds. What did the prince say? When the archbishop said, I take your princely word for these redresses, Prince John says, I give it you and will maintain my word. Archbishop, will you break your faith, meaning your integrity, your honor, your loyalty to your word? Prince John, I pawned thee none. Pawned. I sold you none. I promised you redress of these same grievances whereof you did complain, which, by mine honor, I will perform with a most Christian care. That is, we will redress these grievances. Notice, grievances aren't persons. Grievances aren't people. Grievances are ideas. But for you rebels, look to taste the due meat for rebellion and such acts as yours. What might Shakespeare mean by this? Notice I said Shakespeare, not Prince John.
does it take an act of rebellion to beg for redress of grievances? Not necessarily. You can petition the government. Only in Shakespeare's day, that was pretty hard. There were a series of uprisings in the 16th century okay, against the government. So one of those uprisings, I'm fuzzy on the dates. I want to say 1550s, 1560s, before Shakespeare was born or when he was still a toddler, was a northern uprising, and the uprising was caused by commoners. And they were rebelling against the aristocracy because the aristocracy was taking common land. Well, the, the idea of a commonwealth, that idea is that the land, generally speaking, belongs to all the people. And the produce and all that of the land belongs to all the people. Only what happens in a land-like country? You have the landed aristocracy, that is the people with lots of land, and because they have power and they are members of parliament, because commoners usually aren't uh, really members of parliament, they get laws passed. And one of the things that, one of the laws that got passed was called, if I remember correctly, the Enclosure Act, which is that, This is the tragedy of the commons? Yeah, which is that rich people could enclose common lands to use as their own. Well, the common lands is where commoners had their sheep grazing, their, if they had any, their cattle, their etc. And so they rose up starting in the north, and they actually overtook some pretty large towns. Coventry, I believe, was one. I want to say York was one. Until the government promised to listen to their grievances if they would lay down their arms their arms and were slaughtered. <coughs> Very similar to the thing that happened in 1381, the peasants revolt. When the peasants rose up, Richard II said, I'll listen to your claims. The peasants put down their arms and Richard sent in the knights and slaughtered them. So, Prince John, but for you rebels, look to taste the due meat for rebellion and such acts as yours. Most shallowly did you these arms commence, fondly brought here and foolishly sent hence? Strike up our drums, pursue the scattered stray. What does that mean, pursue the scattered stray? It probably means go kill them. Those men who have left the army and are now heading back home on the highways, byways, little sad lanes, Okay. God and not we hath safely fought today. Some guard these traitors to the block of death, treason's true bed, and yield her up of breath. Okay. What does that tell us about Prince John? <coughs> the play's about Hal, soon to be Henry V. In also, to an extent, about Henry IV. What about Prince John? What does this show us about Prince John? As opposed to Hal, from what we've seen, at least, of Hal. Prince John seems to act for the most part disingenuous. Okay. okay. He, he did say, you know, I didn't fool you. I said I would address your problems, and I will hold true to that, but you're still rebels, and that's still treason, and that's still wrong. Okay. What else? Mackenzie, you want to say something? <laughs> well, I was thinking like how um, the king said, you know, he's kind of an actor, you know, how after this song, kind of, he drank with them and he almost felt like the Lord was saying, okay, I'll do this for you. Like, or he acted kind of like he was friends with them. And then when it actually came to time to do anything, he went back. Not really went back on his word, like you said. He didn't ever say that he would do that, but he is almost like he almost led them to believe. It's almost like he leans forward to pat him on the back, and the shiv comes out, you know. 
almost like, okay? One, this guy's got a spine of steel. He's shrewd. He's shrewd. How old is he? Remember, he's only like 15 or 16. He's really young, okay? Who would make a good king? <laughs> what did his father, King Henry IV, tell Hal? In the first part, he's taken your place, okay? There's a reason why Prince John is given command of this army. And why Hal is with his father <laughs> to lead the other army. Is, I'm, not, I'm not saying this is the case. I'm just throwing out the possibility. Might it be that the king doesn't entirely trust his eldest son? Wanna, wanna, wants to keep his eyes on him? Bear in mind, Westmoreland is a grizzled old warrior. Westmoreland shows up again in Henry V. The great, the, one of the greatest speeches of the English language is the St. Crispin's Day speech that Henry V delivers. It's prompted by Westmoreland and some things Westmoreland says. You can look it up in the, either in the play or online, okay? Um, four three, we're mostly going to skip, dealing with Falstaff and in interaction with Colville. Um, four four. Okay. The king and Warwick and others come in with Gloucester. Gloucester's the king's brother, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, as is Clarence. And <coughs> pick up on around line 48 and following. Okay. The king tells Clarence, keep your eye on Prince Hal. Clarence, 49, I shall observe him with all care and love. King, why aren't thou not at Windsor with him, Thomas? Uh, he's not there. Hal isn't at Windsor, Lord. He's in London. And Hal accompanied. That is, who's keeping an eye on him? Who's, whose day is it to keep their eye on Hal? Canst thou tell that? What does he mean by canst thou tell that? Yeah, but there's a little bit more than that. Spit it out. Notice, Clarence isn't, you know, he's not freely offering information. A good lawyer will tell you, don't only answer the question you're being asked. Don't, don't offer anything else. Uh, he's with Pons and other his continual followers. Continual. What does that mean? Incessant is a beautiful word. They're just always with him. Like wherever Hal goes, he's got this gaggle of low-life scum. <laughs> okay, I'm being a little facetious there. But. Most subject he is, or most subject he is, the fattest soil to weeds. Notice the image again. Shakespeare loves the image of fertile soil and weeds, of the garden and weeds. And he, the noble image of my youth, is overspread with them. What does he mean, the noble image of my youth? Shakespeare loves this image. He uses it throughout the sonnets, especially the first 20. Dead ringer. I mean, Henry saying, if I could go back 20 years, we'd be twins. But notice, he's the noble image of my youth. Is what? Overspread with weeds. Therefore, my grief stretch, stretches itself beyond the hour of death. I, I'm still going to be sorrowing when I'm dead. The blood weeps from my heart when I do shape and forms imaginary. The unguided days and rotten times that you shall look upon when I am sleeping with my ancestors. What's he think about the future? Why? OK. 
because hell is going to be clean now. And he is surrounded, overgrown with weeds. For when his headstrong riot hath no curb, no boundary, no control, when rage and hot blood are his counselors, when means and lavish manners meet together, okay, means in lavish manners, right? Because you can have lavish manners, but not have the bank account to pay for it. My wife and I always used to joke early in our marriage when we didn't have any money, and even now when we have a little bit more, but not you know, a lot by any means, champagne tastes on a beer budget, you know? That's what he's talking about. The only problem is, Hal's got champagne tastes and the budget for it. Why? Future king. Oh, with what wing shall his affection fly toward fronting peril and opposed decay? Fronting. He's going to rush headlong into problems. The problems are of his own creation. Warwick, my gracious Lord, you look beyond him quite. That is, you are overlooking your son. All right? You're, you're going too far. The prince but studies his companions like a strange tongue. What does he mean, like a strange tongue? He's trying to learn their language. He's saying Hal's companions are like foreigners to him. He's trying to learn what they are like. Well, who are Hal's companions? They're the everyday common people of England. Warwick is saying Hal is trying to become what? A populist. Okay. He wants the people to support him. Where to, wherein to gain the language, all right, tis needful that the most immodest word be looked upon and learned, which, once attained, your highness knows comes to no further use but to be known and hated. In other words, Hal has to look at, for lack of a better phrase, vice. To know what it is, so that he doesn't fall into it himself and will hate it. Vice meaning all the, the wrong manners and behaviors. Okay. Do we ever see anywhere in, in the first play or the second play, Hal cavorting with a hooker or prostitute? No. Do we see him drinking? Do we see him drinking to excess? No. Seemingly, what is Hal doing in all of those scenes that he's around Falstaff and the others? Observing and acting on it. You know, his glass gets refilled, and it's like you sometimes see in movies, knowing that someone is trying to get me drunk, they pour it in the planter and pretend to drink. So, like gross terms, the prince will in the perfectness of time, very biblical idea, cast off his followers, and their memory shall as a pattern or a measure live by which his grace must meet the lives of other, turning past evils to advantages. That is, how will have in his mind when he becomes a king and judge of others, when he holds the power of life and death, he'll know what the person, for example, who might be in the dock, he'll know what that person is going through. He'll understand. You know, one of, one of the things when a, a, a Supreme Court justice retires or dies, one of the things you'll always hear in the political discourse about whether or not person A or person B should be nominated is, 
does that person have an understanding of what it's like for the rest of us to be under the law? Two of our Supreme Court justices say, no, <laughs> most of us don't. Why? With the exception of, I think now two people on the Supreme Court, everybody else for the last like 40 or 50 years, all were either a graduate of Harvard or Yale. Uh, Barrett, Notre Dame, I don't want to say, um, No, he was Yale, I believe. I think Barrett's the only one who didn't go to one of the Ivies. Because <coughs> Notre Dame's, you know, low class compared to Harvard and Yale. It's still tremendously expensive and very, very elite. He's saying, Hal's going to be a king not just of the elite. King. He listens to the speech. To seldom when the bee doth leave her comb in the dead carry it. What does he mean? You've got a gloss down there. Rarely does the bee that has made a honeycomb in dead carry it abandon that honeycomb. In other words, Hal's not going to leave his partying life. All right? Westmoreland comes in. He gives the king a document. <coughs> and delivers the news of what has happened with Prince John and the rebels with the North and such, okay? Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see, the king swoons and they take him off to his room, essentially, okay? Four, five. Notice now, the king is born to another part of the stage. So he's on a beer, a cot, if you want. I shouldn't have said beer, because beer implies B-I-E-R, impending death, but that is happening, okay? So he's carried in, and he's lying there. They place him on his bed, it's a big bed, obviously, and on the pillow next to him, they place the crown. That's why it's kind of uncomfortable to sleep with a crown on. Clarence, his eye is hollow and he changes much. His eye is hollow means shrunken. He's near death. Okay. Prince comes in. This is Hal. If it's John, it's Lancaster or John or Prince John. Hal comes in. And he talks with Gloucester and Warwick and Clarence. And he says, I'll sit and keep watch. So the king is there, the king's asleep. Interesting. Does this qualify as a soliloquy? King doesn't hear him. Soliloquy literally is obviously what? Solo, qui, words. One person speaking on the stage. Why doth the crown lie there upon his pillow, being so troublesome a bedfellow? <laughs> Put it somewhere else. Let him sleep. Of polished perturbation, gold and care, that keeps the ports of slumber open wide to many a watchful night. We saw early in the play the king delivers a long soliloquy about what? Why he can't sleep. That's because of the weight of the crown. Sleep with it now, yet not so sound and half so deeply sweet as he whose brow with homely big and bound snores out the watch of night. That is, but you won't sleep as soundly as some guy who's just gotten home dealing with the cares of the day, hits the pillow, and is out cold. O majesty, when thou dost pinch thy bearer, thou dost sit like a rich armor worn in heat of day. <coughs> that scales, excuse me, sculpts with safety. That is, if you're wearing that armor and it's 95 degrees outside, you're like in an oven. 
By his gates of breath there lies a downy feather which stirs not. So he's got his head on the pillow. The implication that his face is on the pillow like this. And a feather from the down pillow is lying on the pillow. And as the king sleeps, that feather doesn't move. Indication? Did he suspire that light and weightless down perforce must move? My gracious Lord, my father. Now does he say, my gracious Lord, my father. No, he doesn't yell it out. It's still very quiet. This sleep is sound indeed. This is a sleep that from this golden wriggle hath divorced so many kings. What sleep is it? The sleep of death. Thy due from me, that is what I owe to you, is tears and heavy sorrows of the blood. What is that of the blood? Ancestral blood. Hal has to behave the way he must behave. Why? Because he is the king's son. He is the future king. He can't escape. Favorite line from Young Frankenstein. Destiny, destiny. There's no escaping destiny. You can't escape your heritage. Thy do for me is tears and heavy sorrows of the blood, which nature, love, and filial tenders, tenderness shall, O oh dear father, pay thee plenteously. My do from thee, that is, what you owe to me upon your death, is this imperial crown, which as immediate from thy place and blood derive itself to me. And he picks up the crown and puts it on his head. Notice he doesn't wait. He doesn't wait for a formal ceremony. The moment Queen Elizabeth II died in September of 22, I think it was, yeah, Charles was crowned last year. What did her Lord's attendant say to Charles? Notice I don't give him a title. Long live the king. He hadn't been invested. The right of investiture had not occurred. But the moment she took her last breath, he became king. Hal is thinking. May as well act the job, you know, puts on the crown. Lo where it sits, which God shall guard. <coughs> God shall guard what? Me. Why? Because I have the crown. Mm, tell that to Richard II. Because Richard II essentially said the same thing. You can't touch me. God made me king. And then some little peon working at the guardhouse kills him. And put the world's whole strength into one giant arm. Does that mean, like, you know, some stupid Marvel super cute whatever movie, his arm suddenly grows, you know, magnificent strength. He's got the gauntlet, so to speak. What does it mean? He has the arm of state. This is playing on the notion of the king's two bodies. That the king has one body, it's going to come up again in Hamlet. The king and the state is also the body of the king. Queen Elizabeth really loved that imagery. She uses it a lot in her proclamations and letters and such. She refers to herself, herself as the king also. Not the queen. <clears throat> okay. Then put the whole world's strength into one giant arm. It shall not force this lineal honor from me. Okay. What does he mean? I, was, I misread it a moment ago. Put all the world together. 
into an arm, meaning strength. It will not take the crown from my head. Why? Because he inherited it from his father. This from thee will I to mine leave, that is, I will leave this crown to my son as you did to me. As tis left to me. And the king wakes up. And Hal probably goes, oops, <laughs> tries to put it back in Alfred. Clarence, Warren, Gloucester. Why would you, why did you leave me here alone? Uh, the prince is here. We left the prince, my brother, here, my liege, who undertook, where is he? Well, Hal, wearing that crown, left the room. We don't know where he went, we just know he left. The French, where? Let me see him. He's not here. The door is open. He's gone this way. Where's the crown? <laughs> Who took the crown? Uh, it was here when we left. Notice what none of them want to do. Well, logic, my lord, would say, see, the king, uh, the prince was here, the crown was here. The prince isn't here, the crown isn't here, ergo. <laughs> the prince hath taken it hence. Go, seek him out. Is he so hasty that he doth suppose my sleep, my death? What's the king implying? He can't wait. Find him, my lord of Warwick. Chide him hither. This part of his conjoins with my disease and helps to end me. That is, spur on my death. See, sons, what things you are, how quickly nature falls into revolt. Gold becomes her object. Who's he speaking to? Clarence, Gloucester, Warwick. Other sons. Hal, John of Lancaster, all of these other names, they're counties. They're the names of the, the duchies or dukedoms. The county of Warwick, the county of Gloucester, the county of Clarence. Okay. He says, see what happens, sons? What? Nature falls into revolt. What does he mean by nature? Hal said it. He said, which nature love and filial tenderness shall, O oh dear father, pay thee plenteously. Nature, because the son proceeds from the father, not in the biblical sense, but, you know, begotten by Henry IV, it does what? What, what does he suggest causes nature to revolt? Gold. Here, the gold signified just the crown. For this, the foolish, over-careful fathers have broke their sleep with thoughts, their brains with care, their bones with industry. For this, they have engrossed and piled up the cankered heaps of strange, cheated gold. That is, they've hoarded wealth. For this they have been thoughtful to invest their sons with arts and martial exercises. That's talking about training them to be princely, to be knights. When like the bee tolling from every flower, our thighs packed with wax, our mouths with honey, we bring it to the hive and like the bees are murdered for our pain. He's talking about son killing father to get the inheritance. This bitter taste yields his engrossment to the ending father. So pretty much everything that Warwick said to him in that last scene, psh, out the door. Why? Because my greedy, no good, rotten, son of a bee son took my crown. He can't wait to have the power. Okay, Hal's brought in. Notice my language, he's brought in, okay. I never thought to speak to you again. Notice what he doesn't say. Father, your face was on the pillow. The feather wasn't moving, you weren't breathing, seemingly. King, line 92. Thy wish was Father Harry to that thought. Wow. 
your wish was that I was dead. And that wish gave birth to the thought, he is dead. I stayed too long by thee. According to your thinking, I should have been dead a while ago. I weary thee. Dost thou so hunger for mine empty chair that thou wilt needs invest thee with my honors before the hour be ripe? O oh, foolish youth, thou seeks the greatness that will overwhelm thee. It's too much for you, Harry. Stay but a little, for my cloud of dignity is held from falling with so weak a wind that it will quickly drop. In other words, I'm on my last breath here, son. My day is dim. Notice, not my night is dim. My day. Why? The night is coming. <laughs> night is darkness. Thou hast stolen that which after some few hours were thine without offense. You think he couldn't have waited just a few hours? And at my death thou hast sealed up my expectation. Thou hast sealed up my expectation. What does he mean? I knew it. I knew it. I knew I couldn't trust you. I knew all you wanted was a kingship. Thy life did manifest thou lovest me not. Manifest. Make known. Shown. So if he doesn't love Henry IV, who does he love? Himself, the crown, Falstaff. Is Falstaff his stand-in father? We had the scene in the first play where Falstaff stands in for Henry IV, and they do that little interview scene. And thou wilt have me die assured of it. I mean, talk about a heartfelt talk between father and son. Only problem is, this is on his deathbed. Thou hidst a thousand daggers in thy thoughts, which thou hast wetted on thy stony heart. Wetted. You sharpen those daggers on your heart of stone to stab at half an hour of my life. What? Canst thou not forbear me half an hour? That, then get thee gone and dig my grave thyself and bid the merry bells ring to thine ear that thou art crowned. That, not that I am dead. Let all the tears that should be due my hearse be drops of balm to sanctify thy head. He's saying, no, you don't want there to be any mourning for my passing. You just want all the celebration for yourself. Only compound me with forgotten dust. And even though I really wanted to do Henry V, it's appropriate we're going to be doing Hamlet next. Because Hamlet talks a lot about compounding dust. Give that which gave thee life unto the worms. Pluck down my officers, break my decrees, for now a time is come to mock at form. So, pluck down my officers means what? Yeah, but he's not talking about military officers. What does every new president do? New cabinet. All those political appointees by the previous president? It is um, common courtesy for those people to submit their resignations, okay? It's standard practice, for example, for every new president to demand the resignation of every standing United States attorney. There's like 90-something of them, judicial districts across the country, okay? You, you, Submit your resignation or get fired. Why? Because the new president wants his or her attorneys in those positions. Okay? So that's what he means by officers. You're going to file all, you're going to fire all the people I've given preferment to, jobs to. And do what? Break my decrees. Starting 
probably in the last 50 years. Many presidents do what on their first day of office? Continue to do the war effort. Yeah, I think Biden did something like 20 or 30. That is, they already have their lawyers drawn up executive orders and the president signed them. What that means is, often the case is, I am rescinding the executive order that the previous president did. And you have to do an official executive order to undo an official executive order. Okay? That's what he's talking about. For now a time has come to mock at form. What does he mean by form? Order, structure, the ceremony of government. Why? Harry the fifth is crowned. Notice, up, vanity, down, royal state. He has no faith in this son. All you sage counselors, hence. In other words, all wisdom, leave. And to the English court assembled now from every region, apes of idleness. Who's he going to appoint? Falstaffs, Bardolphs, Kwanzas. King finishes. I'm not going to read the rest of it. And Hal kneels <laughs> and returns the crown. So what does that mean? I can't get on my knees because there we go. He gets down on his knees and he does this. He holds that crown up. He elevates the crown over himself, meaning I am still beneath it. And it's yours. And says, oh, pardon me, my liege, but for my tears, the moist impediments unto my speech, I had forestalled this dear and deep rebuke, ere you with grief had spoken, I had heard the course of it so far. If I had known how far this grief ran in you, I would have stopped it. I had forestalled. He's saying, if only I knew how low I have sunk in your estimation. Should he have known? And I don't mean should the king have revealed this earlier. I mean, should Hal have known? My own thought? Yes, he should have known. The king's previous conferences with him kind of made it clear. But what did Hal think? I can change the king's mind. I can change the king's mind and who else's? The people's mind. How? Easily. He thought changing perceptions is like turning on and off the light switch. It's not like that though, right? Back in the 80s, President Reagan had a labor secretary named Ray Donovan. I know there's a Showtime or HBO show about the guy with the same name. And the guy was charged with um, some kind of crime. I think it was an FBI sting or something like that. Had to resign his position, all that, and he was acquitted. Fully acquitted, not guilty. And when he was acquitted, he came out of the courtroom, all the media was there, and he said, where do I go to get my reputation back? He never did get his reputation back, even though he was fully acquitted, okay? There is your crown. And he that wears the crown immortally long guarded yours, that is, God. <laughs> God guard you. If I affect it more than as your honor and as your renown, let me know more from this obedience rise. He's saying that the physical stance he is in on his knees is an obedience. Notice he's not being obedient. It is a duty owed to the crown and to the king which my most inward true and duteous spirit teacheth this prostrate and exterior bending. That is, I am within the same as I am without. That is on my outside. 
I am within. My spirit is what? Inwardly true and duteous. It is prostrating before you. God witness with me when I here came in and found no course of breath within your majesty, how cold it struck my heart. What does it mean if your heart goes cold? Sadness, Sadness sorrow, death. If I do faint, oh, let me in my present wildness die and never live to show the incredulous world, <coughs> the noble change that I have purposed. Why does he call the world incredulous? What does it mean to be incredulous? Credible means believable. Incred cred means to believe. Incredulous means the unbelieving world. What's he saying about the unbelieving world? To show the unbelieving world the noble change that I have what? Purposed. Intended. What's the problem? Hasn't shown it yet. Coming to look on you thinking you dead and dead almost my leash to think you were, I spake unto this crown it's having sense and thus upbraided it. The care on thee depending hath fed upon the body of my father. The care on thee depending, that is, those who depend on the care of the crown, that is, the crown's care of those beneath them, have done what? Those cares have fed upon the body of my father. That is, those cares, dear dad, have eaten you away. He's saying, you are dying because of your care for the kingdom. Therefore, thou best of gold art worst of gold. Other, less fine and carrot is more precious, preserving life and medicine potable. But thou, most fine, most honored, most renowned, hast eat thy bearer. Notice, he's here not talking about the cares of the kingdom. He's talking about the crown itself. The crown has consumed the king. Thus, my most royal liege, accusing it, I put it on my head to try with it. That is, to do battle with it as with an enemy that had before my face murdered my father, the quarrel of a true inheritor. But if it did infect my blood with joy or swell my thoughts to any strain of pride, meaning, aha, I've got the crown now, you know. If any rebel or vain spirit of mine did with the least affection of a welcome give entertain to the might of it, let God forever keep it from my head. Give it to somebody else. And make me as the poorest vassal is that doth with awe and terror kneel to it. Oh. Son, God put it in thy mind to take it hence. What's he just said? God told you to do that. That thou mightst win the more thy father's love. Well done, Harry. Good speech. I believe you. Plead it so wisely in excuse of it. Come, sit by my bed. And he says, God knows, my son, by what paths and indirect crooked ways I met this crown. What does he mean, indirect crooked ways? I didn't come by the crown legally. And I myself know well how troublesome it sat upon my head. To thee it shall descend with better quiet better opinion, better confirmation. Why? Because it will pass on from father to eldest son, the way it is supposed to. Is there a problem still, though? And God knows the full of your argument. Yeah. Could be a problem. Well, could be, if John wanted to Opposes brother. 
What else? If I steal something from somebody else, and I die with that in my possession, and I leave it in my will to my eldest son, or child, or children, and everybody knows it was stolen, is it still theirs? No, not really. Not really. The crown still, mm, how it got to be Henry V's, mm, it, there's still a problem there. Which is why there are still people today who claim Charles is not the rightful heir of the crown. Okay. The heirs, for example, of Bonnie Prince Charlie, who was overthrown in 1745, who made a claim for the crown of England and Scotland. Why? Because he was a descendant, a relative of King James the first class sixth of Scotland. Well, the Stuart line fled. It abdicated the throne in 1688. But one lived, <laughs> an offspring. He tried to claim the throne and uprising was put down. So, he says, you won't have that problem. For in what was, line 198, for in what but for what in me was purchased falls upon thee in a more fairer sort. So shall so thou the garland wear successively. Successively, you are the succeeding one to wear it. You get it by right of primogenitor. Yet though thou stand more sure than I could do, that is, you have legal claim, thou art not firm enough. Since griefs are green. How green are the griefs? The rebellion was just put down? Mm, not quite. Henry V opens with three rebels being executed. Okay. Therefore, my Harry, skipping a couple more lines, 211, be it thy course to busy giddy minds. Uh, let me go back up. He says, when I got this crown, I purposed to go to the Holy Land. Why? To pray for forgiveness? Mm -hmm. No. To get the people to rise up in support of a new crusade that to leave many out to the Holy Land, uh, lest rest and line still make them look too near to my estate. Therefore, my Harry, line 211, be it thy course to busy, giddy minds with foreign quarrels, that action henceforth out may waste the memory of the former days. There was a movie done in the late 80s that the title of the movie entered our public discourse in the 90s during the Clinton administration. Right at the time of the House impeachment of Clinton for perjury, the Monica Lewinsky stuff, Clinton went after Osama bin Laden, launched a bunch of missiles into what turned out to be, literally, an aspirin factory in the Sudan. Blew up an aspirin factory did that at the same time, literally. That occurred when Clinton was testifying to the special counsel. And everybody, left and right, used the phrase, wag the dog. Because there was a film called Wag the Dog, and it was about when trouble, political problems happen, what do presidents do? War. War. Why? It diverts attention. That's exactly what Henry IV is talking about. It'll take people's minds away from the here and now to over there. And bear in mind, and this is without instant communication that we have. More would I, that is, I would tell you more, but my lungs are wasted so that strength of speech is utterly denied me how I came by the crown, oh God forgive and grant it may with thee in true peace live. 
And he says, my gracious liege, do you want it? Look, you want it, not you inherited it. <laughs> There's a problem. You want it, wore it, kept it, gave it me, then plain and right must my possession be, which I, with more than with a common pain against all the world, will rightfully maintain. What does it mean, more than with a common pain? Well, against the world, maintain. How's Harry going to get it? When his father dies, that's the common pain. The common pain is everyone mourns when a family member dies. And he says, that's how I'm going to get it. The same kind of mourning Joe Blow out in the field suffers when his father died. And he says, and I will maintain that pain. He doesn't mean I'm going to keep it up. He means I will swear it to anybody's face that my pain is real. Okay? So John of Lancaster comes in and others, we're going to skip 5-1, go to 5-2. Okay? We're gonna, we will finish this. 5-2, Warwick, Lord Chief Justice, come in. How now, my Lord Chief Justice, wither away. Chief Justice, how doth the king? Exceeding well. His cares are now all ended. He's dead. Henry IV has passed. I hope not dead. He's walked the way of nature. And to our purposes, he lived no more. Forget about Henry IV. Um, I wish that His Majesty had called me with him. I wish I died with him. Why? Because who does the Chief Lord Justice now have, have to deal with? Okay? So they bring in the king's body. And Warwick says, here comes this heavy issue of dead Harry. Sorry, he's not being brought in yet. The heavy issue of dead Harry. Here comes the dead king's sons. Prince John of Lancaster, Thomas of Clarence, Humphrey of Gloucester, Westmoreland, and others. Okay. And the Chief Justice speaks to these princes and says to them, 35, What I did, I did in honor, led by the imperial impartial conduct of my soul, and never shall you see that I will beg, beg a ragged and forestalled remission. Because they're talking to him about his interactions with Falstaff and Prince Hal. And he's saying, I did what I did because it's what the king commanded. And I'm not going to beg for forgiveness now. The king comes in. Warwick says, here comes the prince. Enter the prince, notice, as King Henry V. He has the crown on. Some film versions have him wearing the robe of state. You know, the red and white ermine. The king says, this new and gorgeous garment, majesty, that's the garment he wears. Okay, It's a biblical illusion, by the way. One of the Psalms says, the Lord has put on his apparel, his majesty. Okay, Sits not so easy on me as you think. What is hell immediately addressing? Their concerns, the popularities. Brothers, you mix your sadness with some fear. <laughs> you're, you're not quite sure. This is the English, not the Turkish court. There's a nice little racial slam. What's he saying? If we were in Turkey, what would you guys be doing? Think if you've ever seen it. Neil Gaiman, book made into film. De Niro, Charlie Cox, Star, Stardust. Stardust. Where you have these brothers to come to be king, and what do they all do? They kill each other. Because it's a great movie's much, 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 much better than a book. It's one of those few times where it's tremendously better. Okay? Don't worry, I'm not going to kill you all off. See, it's not where he's saying, I'm worried you're going to try to kill me to take. He's saying, I'm not going to kill you all off to make sure you don't attempt to take the throne. He says, I'm still Harry. 
But Harry, Harry, yet be sad, good brothers, for by my faith it very well becomes you. Sorrow to royal in you appears, but I will deeply put the fashion on and wear it in my heart. So, be sad, but entertain no more of it, good brothers, than a joint burden laid upon us all. For me, by heaven, I bid you be assured, I'll be your father and your brother too. Why does, what does he mean, I'll be your father? King, protector, guardian. Let me but bear your love, I'll bear your cares. Yet weep that Harry's dead, and so will I. But Harry lives and shall convert those tears by number into hours of happiness. He's like, I'm going to multiply your tears and bring happiness out of them. Princess, uh, we hope no otherwise. And he's like, you look strangely on me. Like they're all giving him the side eye. You. Lord Chief Justice, he says, you are, I think, assured I love you not. If I be measured rightly, your majesty hath no just cause to hate me. If you understand me properly, you know that you have no reason to hate me. The king, no. Ooh, that's how might a prince of my great hopes forget so great indignities you laid upon me? What? Great rebuke? Roughly send to prison the immediate heir of England? Was this easy? May this be washed in Lethe, the river of forgetfulness, before you go into Hades and be forgotten? You think I'm not going to remember that? Oh, you're right. The Chief Justice. I then did use the person of your father. That is, I was then acting in the person of your father. Your father gave me charge to do that. Okay? Big, long speech. King, you are right, Justice, and you weigh this well. Therefore, still bear the balance and the sword. The balance to do what? Weigh out justice and the sword. This is the difference between the American system and the British system. To meet out justice. See, the balance weighs and finds out whether or not justice is on your side or against you. And if it's against you, then you use the sword for punishment. And I do wish your honors may increase till you do live to see a son of mine offend you and obey you as I did. In other words, your job's safe. And I hope you live a long life so that when I have a son, you can be to him, <coughs> him <coughs> what you were to me. <coughs> Happy am I that have a man so bold that dares do justice on my proper son. Okay? So, Speaks to his brothers, uh, and he finishes kind of to the Chief Justice, line 118. There is my hand, you shall be as a father to my youth. He's saying, I'm going to look to you for advice, for counsel, for wisdom. To his brothers, he says, Princes all, believe me, I beseech you. My father has gone wild into his grave or in his tomb. By my affections and with the spirit, sadly I survive to mock the expectation of the world. I've got to prove the world wrong. To frustrate prophecies, frustrate prophecies, to raise out rotten opinion, who hath written me down after my, one of Shakespeare's favorite words, seeming. After my seeming. The tide of blood in me hath proudly flowed in vanity till now. How do we know? He finishes his speech. Skip the next scene. Very last scene. Okay. Hal is now, King Henry V, in full regalia of state. All right. And he's marching by. And Falstaff's in the crowd. 
And Falstaff yells out, God save thy grace, King Hal, my royal Hal. Pistol, the heavens thee guard and keep, most royal imp of fame. Now, who's he referring to as the imp of fame? How? Okay. No matter who you are, you don't call the king an imp. God save thee, my sweet boy, king. My lord, chief justice, speak to that vain man. Now, speak probably doesn't mean literally go have words with him. My king, my Job, I speak to thee. Notice, my heart. Is he saying, I speak my heart to thee? Or is he saying, how? You are my heart. I know thee not, old man. Remember the scene in the first part where Hal pretends to be the king, the king, uh, Falstaff pretends to be Hal? After, I mean, before, Falstaff pretended to be the king and Hal was himself and they talked about Falstaff's influence and then they switched places and Hal pretended to be the king and Falstaff pretended to be the prince and Falstaff gives this long thing where he says, banish me not, banish not Falstaff, banish Pwans, banish Bardolph, banish Pito, but dear John Falstaff, banish not. And Hal says, I will, or I shall, I will. I know thee not, old man. Fall to thy prayers. How ill white hairs becomes a fool and jester. I have long dreamt of such a kind of man, so serpent swelled, so old, so profane, but being awake, I do despise my dream. What's Hal telling us? Like the lovers in the forest, Hal's previous experience with Falstaff was like a dream. He's telling Falstaff, none of that was real. Make less thy body hence, and more thy grace. Leave gormandizing. Don't be such a glutton. Know the grave doth gape for thee thrice wider than for other men. Now, that can mean literally it's going to take a much larger grave to hold you. But it also means what? Death is more ready for you if you continue in your ways. Reply not to me with a full-born jest. And I think that means Shakespeare intends that to be a stage direction. When he says to Falstaff about the wider grave, it's like Falstaff starts to open his mouth and Hal just shuts him down. Presume not that I am the thing I was. For God doth know, so shall the world perceive that I have turned away my former self. In other words, I've been reborn. Look what happens to Prince Fre uh, Duke Frederick in As You Like It. He's a rotten, dirty, mean, evil SOB. And then he meets an old monk and becomes a convertite. He's converted. He's reborn, so to speak. I've turned away my former self, so will I those that kept me company. I will turn them away. When not as here I am as I have been, that is, when you hear the old drinking, thieving Hal is back, then you can show up. And thou shalt be as I was the tutor and the feeder of my rights. Till then I banish thee on pain of death, as I've done the rest of my misleaders, not to come near our person by 10 miles. So you got to wait, stay 10 miles away from me, OK? So Chief Justice then says, carry Falstaff to the fleet, Fleet Street Prison, right? And take all his company with him. My lord, my lord, he goes, go ahead. I'll hear you soon. Prince John, ooh, I like this. This is how a king should behave. He hath intent, his wanted followers shall all be very well provided. In other words, the king did what? Publicly. He had to shame 
football staff and put him in his place. And then what did the king do privately? He's made provision for his care. He's made provision for his keep. Falstaff's going to get a pension. Why? So that he doesn't thieve from Mr. Quickly and the others. So that he can become honest. Okay? Health takes care for what? His people. It's an implication. He's going to be like this for the kingdom too. All right? So, last thing. I know it's a minute over. Look at the epilogue and the last paragraph of the epilogue. Don't worry, folks. There's another play coming that has Sir John Falstaff. I mean, that's what he's saying. Why? Because anecdotally, we're told the people who went to Shakespeare's plays so loved Falstaff, they wanted more. Queen Elizabeth supposedly said, that she wanted a play focusing with Falstaff as the main character. And Shakespeare said, yes, your liege, and he writes The Merry Wives of Windsor. Okay? That's not the play being alluded to. The play being alluded to is Henry V, where we see Falstaff very briefly, and then he dies. Okay? Um, if you came in late, I handed this out. I talked about it. It's on the beginning of the... Um, Recording that'll be up. It takes like four hours now to upload this to you. Uh, by four o'clock or so this afternoon. So if you have questions, send me an email. If you have papers, revised papers, bring those up, please. This um, history exam is due.